Thank you very much for joining us today. Before we get started, I'd like to review how to use the GoToWebinar system in order to optimize the experience today. Briefly explain how you can interact during this implementation subgroup meeting using this system. Um, for, for those that are on the attendee list, we have a microphone that's put on mute for the meeting. You can get the audio over the telephone or the speakers of the computer to improve sound quality if needed. Uh, however, please put your microphone on mute while you're not speaking to avoid any noise while others are speaking. By the way, the panel is set to hide automatically. Please use the arrow, uh, the orange arrow to show or hide the control panel at your own will. You can change this setting on the view menu at the top of the panel. At the end of the meeting, we'll have a follow-up survey. Uh, please respond to the questions so we can incorporate your feedback in the work of the community. And thank you. Now we will start the presentation. I'm Stuart Young. I, pre I represent Fiatech in Europe and the Middle East. On behalf of all of us at Fiatech, I'd like to thank you for joining us today for this meeting of the implementation subgroup that is part of the mobile IT community of interest. Today we've put together a panel of subject matter experts who will discuss challenges in augmented reality and visualization in construction sites. Before we get started, before we get onto the panel rather, I'd like to take a minute or two to remind everybody of the objectives of this implementation subgroup as part of the mobile IT community. As all of you, all of you know, the objective of the Muted. Unmuted. Unmute you. Um, on you go, Steve. Okay. Um, just a quick note. I, I don't know if someone mentioned, but uh, Stuart, I think you may have actually been muted on most of our lines, or at least some of our lines, uh, for for your intro. So I can certainly give a, a little background on myself. Um, but if there was anything you know critical to chat about, we may want to uh, retouch on that. Um, so my name is Stephen Ayer. I'm a, an assistant professor at Arizona State University. Uh, I'm working with our uh, School of Sustainable Engineering in the Built Environment and our uh, uh, Dell Webb School of Construction. Uh, I'm really excited to be joining today. I think the topics that we're going to talk about uh, for me are very, you know, kind of near and dear to my research heart, so to speak. Um, I'm very interested in, in augmented and, and even sort of just mixed reality on the whole. And I think we're, you know, kind of in a very exciting time now where we've got lots of uh, technologies that may not have been created for construction, 
you know, mobile computing devices, wearable computing devices. Uh, but I think we're starting to see some exciting use cases of, of how we may be able to leverage some of these tools um, to really take some of the BIM and VDC content uh, and bring it into the field uh, with a, a mixed reality interface to, to see content in context. Uh, so really excited to be here today, and I, I look forward to our discussion. Okay, thanks, Steve. Um, Colin, you like to introduce yourself, please? Sure. Hi, my name is Colin Muirhead, and uh, I'm a business analyst with Shell, and I work primarily with our capital projects organization, um, helping to identify and provide um, kind of and manage IT, new IT needs for uh, for our capital projects groups. And one of my main focuses is around mobility within our capital project space, and uh, kind of driving this mobility roadmap for uh, for our group. Okay. Thank you, Colin. Um, Manny, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Sure. Um, this is Manny Golpabra. I'm Assistant Professor of Civil Engineering and of Computer Science um, at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, I'm also excited to be speaking about augmented reality. Um, I have been working on creating uh, mobile augmented reality solutions uh, for the past uh, four years as a faculty and prior to it uh, when I was doing my PhD. I have been a member of Fiat Tech since 2009. And I've uh, really enjoyed the interactions that I've had with the uh, member companies um, in terms of uh, uh, workflows that uh, could be devised for leveraging augmented reality solutions. And um, together with some of the uh, member companies, we've been able to uh, tran uh, translate one of our technologies into a product. Thank you. Thank thanks very much, Money. Ian, w would you like to uh, introduce yourself as well? Hi there, Ian Miskimin. Um, I suppose I, I wear quite a few hats in a, an environment like this. Uh, the one that pays the bills is that I, I work for Bentley Systems and run the, uh, the BIM Academy for um, Crossrail uh, and for uh, uh, Bentley Systems. I also sit on the UK BIM Task Group, uh, helping the government deliver a level two mandate for conflict BIM. And I'm um, the community organisation which is um, dedicated to the development of excellence for mobile IT and innovation within construction. Um, I'm one of the, uh, I suppose, the, 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 the co-runners of the, uh, the, the mobility group. Okay, thanks Ian. Fernando, could you introduce yourself please? Yeah, thank you, Stuart. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Fernando Mondragon. I'm a postdoctoral fellow here at Fiatic. I'm working on the real-time field reporting project, uh, looking into implementation of mobile technologies for for field managers. And I'm also a coordinator of the uh, of the mobile IT community of interest together with Stuart. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much, Fernando. Okay. I'll move on to the next slide. So today's discussion and proposed topics. What are the issues that augmented reality and other visualization tools can address? What do you think are the most relevant issues of those mentioned and why? And how does the use of AR and visualization tools fit with existing strategies for the use of BIM and mobile tools? What other technologies overlap with the ones mentioned? What are the practical challenges that arise with the use of these technologies and how, how can these challenges be addressed? So with that, I'll hand over to Ian and Ian will take it forward with the discussion. Thanks very much, Ian. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Stuart. Um, Certainly, uh, from my own perspective, we've uh, run quite a few augmented reality projects within the commit organisation uh, for um, the UK and also going over to, to parts in Europe and have found an awful lot of troubles um, going on within that uh, area and such. Um, some being resolved uh, using technology and is being solved using process um, and lowering the expectations. It would be really interesting to hear from the, the, the experiences of um, those barriers uh, and what they feel the shortcomings of uh, accountability at the moment. So I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll throw that one out to the uh, to the group straight away, really.
I want to unmute your mic before you start speaking. <laughs> Hi, Ian, this is Colin. I'm having a bit of trouble hearing you. So you were a bit garbled there. I don't know if that's the same for everyone else. Yeah, unfortunately, I've been having the same thing as well, actually. Maybe you could uh, repeat the question, if possible. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll revert back to the, uh, the way I speak on the, the, the military radio here, which is really slowly and loudly and clearly because it's, um, because our communications in the military are awful uh, and go to meetings sometimes isn't um, any better. So whilst I've been pulling the mobile technologies and augmented reality in um, specific here within the UK and in Europe, um, we come across a lot of problems, uh, showstoppers Recording, um, that have been circumvented through either technology improvements or process improvements. I mean, one example of technology improvements is multiplexing uh, location um, devices within a mobile device, and the other on the process side is lowering expectations uh, for what people really want out of their augmented reality. So the question really out to the panel is to find out what your experiences are of those barriers and potentially how you've overcome some of them. Or was that garbled as well? I, I can hear you, Ian. Yeah, I, I think I think I understand the question here. I mean, one of the I think interesting challenges that we we see with with this is you brought up a good point that there's maybe two halves of the equation here of the uh, the technical side, which um, you know certainly there are some technological limitations, um, but at least from my perspective, I think we're getting to a point where there's a lot of really promising technologies out there um, where, you know, in some ways uh, our, our excuses to, uh, to say, well, we can't use the technology for this or that yet um, may be starting to be limited. I think in some ways, um, for me, maybe the interesting question is um, how we can use augmented reality to serve us as kind of the human. Um, I think we've seen, maybe not in the construction context, but just um, other contexts, you know, in, in, in life and computer uh, examples, where we've seen augmented reality, some of which have kind of stuck. Um, I know we've got a few folks in, in the UK here, but uh, for anyone that watches uh, an American football game, the, the yellow first down line, I think, is a classic example of a very simple augmented reality application that has served its purpose well. Uh, other examples, you know, have been novel but have, have worn off. So bringing that, I think, to uh, design and construction realm, I think maybe from the process side, we've really got to identify the key use cases uh, where the tool, the augmented reality, is serving a core function and addressing some need that you know we as humans can't otherwise serve without it. So maybe that's in the form of viewing hidden objects or viewing objects that uh, we as a human don't know where they are. But, but I think that's a challenge right now is we're still trying to figure out uh, what are the high value use cases. And I think, I mean, from, from what we've seen in the past, I think that's probably where we're going to see um, major value from, from using these kind of tools. Yeah, certainly. Um, I think it, it's setting people's expectations uh, within those cases as well. Um, I think one of our biggest enemies, I suppose, has been uh, Hollywood. Um, the, uh, uh, you see the films where augmented reality is extremely fast, accurate, and does absolutely everything. Whereas we know that's not the case with uh, most technologies. So what we've got to do is work out how um, how fit for purpose is that particular accuracy overlaying whatever the uh, uh, information might be, the amount of information, the amount of detail, um, and whether that is fit for the purpose that it's intended for. And if it is, great. We can try and set our expectations too high uh, and almost in those Hollywood clouds of um, augmented reality. 
Well, and I think one of the, the challenges with it is on sort of the BIM and the VDC side, we're, we're advancing a lot as more people embrace it and start using it. I mean, you hear a lot of projects talking about we're modeling down to, you know, hardware and, and, and very small details, but you know, to your point for, for mixed reality, sometimes we don't want all that detail. In fact, sometimes you want to strip things down. So I think there, there can be a tendency um, to over augment. I don't know if that's the best word, but, um, you know, to say, well, we've got all this content, let's use it. And it's sort of a, if you highlight everything, you highlight nothing kind of thing. So that, that may be a challenge that we'll, we'll start to see here. Yeah, expectations need to be set uh, for that. Um, so on those people on the panel here, um, I don't know whether anybody wants to expand that a little bit further, maybe Colin or Manny? Yeah, I was going to add, I think from, from, from my perspective, you know, this is the, the augmented reality piece is kind of that next step in, the, in this mobility journey. You know, we've been really focused on getting mobile technology, you know, into our projects, being used by our construction teams and things like that. And, and now it's kind of, you know, we're taking that next step in, you know, how can we provide additional functionality? And I think, um, uh, I think uh, Stephen mentioned before around the use cases and, you know, the importance of really providing that. And that's something that we've really focused on is, is trying to define those use cases and, and defining use cases that really add value that can't be provided easily by other functions. You know, it's and it's one of those. Is it is it really is it really that valuable to see something in augmented reality when you can see it in a 3D model that runs on a tablet too? You know, so that's kind of what is what does that augmented reality provide you above and beyond what's already there? And you know, and so we're starting to look at things like um, like clash detection and things like that on site. So what's going to be built in in you know in a particular spot? Is that you know is that something that you know you can reroute piping through there, you know, or those kind of things is what, what we're starting to look at in that use case discussion. Yeah. Manny? Um, yes, I also wanted to add uh, a, a little bit to this uh, topic. So, you know, um, there's been probably two different types of approaches to bringing augmented reality to construction practices. One, uh, that we've been looking to existing solutions and see how we can uh, modify and adapt them to work for a specific um, uh, workflow uh, on the job site. Or some of us have been also working on creating um, uh, new um, augmented reality solutions that would actually uh, solve the problem that we have. Um, regardless of that, I think there are three key issues uh, with respect to the core technology that we'll be needing on any job site. One, um, any augmented reality solution um, should provide um, complete access to project information. I definitely agree that all information um, may not need to be superimposed on a live view, but perhaps if um, you know, there's a moment that any person who will be using the solution has to go back to the main office or has to contact somebody else at the uh, uh, trailer, to get access to information, then the benefit of using this augmented reality is completely gone. So we need to be able to come up with a so solution that can provide um, access to information at the level that it's needed, whenever it's needed. The second component is the capability of content authoring. And this is something that is often um, uh, missed when you're discussing about augmented reality. If you plan on bringing augmented reality, and let's say, for example, for um, uh, project controls on the job site. You need to also provide the capability of content authoring. You need to provide the user capability of adding information um, to the elements that are in the field of view of that particular user. Now, there are two issues here. One, um, sometimes the level of details that we have in a 3D model may not, may not match the reality. And in that case, we need to have a customized solution that will allow the user to add information to elements beyond what is represented in the BIM. The other one is when you have BIM, um, and the question is, how would you be able to come up with this uh, solution that will be scalable? Uh, so this leads to, to the third point that I want to make, and that's the scalability of the solution. Often, we've tried to um, come up with mobile augmented reality solutions that will be sitting on a client device, whether that happens to be a tablet, whether that happens to be a smartphone. I think we need to be uh, thinking how uh, we will be able to leverage a sort of a client-server solution where the entire project information would be sitting on a cloud and we would only allow the client uh, device to access information or um, author content 
back to that project information. This is aligned with the vision that we've always had with respect to uh, bringing VDC solutions to any job site. We will still be able to use the same cloud that we've been using as part of design, as part of pre-construction processes, and essentially extend the application of the same information with very simple client uh, interfaces uh, for people to be able to either query information or, or essentially act on it. So again, just to summarize it, I think the key functionalities will be querying um, information at the right level of detail whenever it's needed, uh, capability of adding content um, at whatever um, desired level of abstraction uh, by the user, and also being able to make sure the solution is scalable, meaning that multiple people on the job site will be able to interact with the same um, information. Yeah, I mean, it's quite a, an interesting thing when you're talking about complete access to the um, information. Certainly one of the biggest problems we have in the UK and, and certainly uh, through quite a lot of Europe is connectivity. Um, so putting connectivity on a construction site, I'm not just talking about uh, out in the middle of nowhere, but even in the centre of London, um, when you're down one of the cross-rail shafts or tunnels, or cuttings or maybe slightly more uh, remote uh, out on a greenfield site doing part of the high speed two uh, rail network, you're not going to get a connection. Um, and putting your complete project uh, information onto a uh, device and taking it out on site is not a, um, it's certainly not possible um, because I don't think those devices can actually control or take that amount of information. Uh, and you've got to think of the security implications of taking that information out and putting it on a device. Um, I mean, those things can be get over, got over through um, technology. But what would be quite nice is what you were talking a little bit about there is more kind of context sensitive um, information. So the fact that it knows who you are, knows which work package you're working on today, um, knows what kind of tasks you're going to be carrying out during that work package, and just gives you the information you require for that particular day. Um, and potentially if you're doing um, surveys using that augmented reality um, to add information, uh, can connect to local sensors, maybe you know, humidity, temperature, um, vibration, whatever it might be, um, to add that kind of information into, uh, back into it without having to have a lot of data um, on the uh, machine itself. So um, certainly there's a, 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 some big issues in the UK market. I don't know how much the connectivity uh, um, it causes a problem within uh, the US. Um, I, I don't have that much experience over your side of the uh, side of the pond. Sure. I think yeah, uh, you're raising an interesting uh, point with respect to connectivity, um, and I can only speak to uh, those projects that we've been involved in. Um, so you know, being an academic, uh, we typically do pilot the studies with uh, different companies, um, most who've been members of Theotech over the past few years. Uh, so what we've essentially done with these companies, and our experience shows that in most cases, these companies have actually provided full access to um, data plan on their job sites, essentially internet access to all mobile devices. Uh, and this has been sort of a requirement that the contract has, has had um, to the owner. So the owner has been responsible to provide that access. Now, we also understand that this is a uh, you know, sort of issue that may not be uh, possible in all job sites. So we, you know, as an example, again, uh, we've been working with companies like Verizon uh, to be able to um, um, provide access to um, 4G uh, to construction sites. That's a market that companies like Verizon are interested in getting into. Um, so again, I think there's two sides to it. Um, things that we do at the pilot study, which are limited, uh, which uh, are more for proof of concept, and then how this solution could be uh, scalable, could transition to the practice. And that's something that perhaps needs to be uh, um, you know, um, uh, having a number of uh, IT providers um, involved in the process. Yeah, just to add to that, I mean, this is Colin, you know, from, from our perspective, the, you know, connectivity on the site, certainly something we strive for in all of our projects, you know, it, it really, it really varies depending on the project. And, you know, even a project that may have full site coverage, uh, wireless coverage, you know, I mean, you may just run into interference in different places in the plant or the, or, you know, the yard, wherever you are. Uh, so you, you know, it's been kind of our standard in, in our mobility initiative that we can't always depend on the fact that we will have wireless connectivity. 
and so this drives a bit, you know, so this can definitely be a barrier a bit in this kind of reality, you know, solution is if it requires that persistent connection, that can be a problem. So I'm curious then, Colin, maybe you could talk to what did, for those instances where you have issues, does that just preclude you from using it, or have you found sort of workaround solutions as we were sort of referring to earlier? Yeah, I mean, I, I, at this point, I, I think it precludes us from using it. Um, so it really is a barrier to implementing the technology. And I think, and I think we, we start reverting back to, you know, other kind of processes that we can, we can operate uh, in a disconnected fashion. And, and another, so just to add to another point, we, we kind of talked about a bit earlier as well, is, I mean, I, I, I see this augmented reality as, you know, as kind of a bolt-on, you know, in, into the, the whole mobile kind of uh, functionality that we do in, in the construction process here. You know, it, it, it was brought up around content authoring and things like that. So certainly, you know, that has... Some uh, some place in augmented reality in you know kind of a, a solution that uh, may be going forward, but there's also other tools that you can use that may not be in augmented reality, but maybe a, a more traditional mobile type uh, tool set. So I think it's something that needs to be looked at as a whole picture as far as what functionality are we really looking to provide out there in the field. Yeah. So um, one of the other issues that was raised whilst we were looking at mobile technologies and um, augmented reality and specifically here in the UK was um, we, we did a, a, a trial with Network Rail who do the track access and track repair um, and they were really concerned about things like uh, Google Glass um, in, in particular with augmented reality on that but also people looking through a device that had part of their um, vision obscured on a construction site and said that you know that was a real health and safety issue uh, and they would definitely not allow any form of augmented reality on their sites. I don't know whether anybody's come across those particular issues. Um, it's probably not so bad on a, uh, on a regular construction site but when you've got trains uh, moving quite fast um, you know, 100 miles an hour or so, uh, um, you've got to be very wary and very um, visible. You've got to be able to vi view people and signals down the track and be able to get out of the way. Um, obscuring people's view uh, isn't the greatest thing in the world. Has anybody else had any of those sort of queries or experiences uh, come back on, on AR? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say at least uh, you hear about these issues a lot in the States, and, and I know one thing that we've seen a lot then is uh, AR used as a uh, more design tool where you don't have, uh, in some cases, you don't have construction things, uh, construction activities going on, and the mm -hmm. safety issue is uh, reduced. But I think it's a very good point, and, you know, if this is going to take off, something that uh, – someone will really need to, to help understand what are the safest ways to use it. Um, I don't know that you could make a blanket statement that um, it will uh, you know, hurt safe, safety efforts. I think you could make an argument in some cases that um, AR is a way of alerting or drawing a user's eye to um, certain objects. And in some instances, I think you may actually be able to use it as a safety tool to alert someone of dangers. Um, but I think a very valid point that uh, at least that needs to be considered uh, when developing tools and processes to use these. And I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head there in the, in the word tool, in the fact that you know, your, your mobile device or your AR tool is a tool and you need to be trained in its use and you need to follow the method statements for safe usage and perhaps even down to the line if it's a, a major tool that has a hazard attached to it, you have a banksman or somebody that stands there keeping watch is your, your second set of eyes whilst you're doing whatever task you're doing um, to ensure that safety isn't breached. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it will come as these tools become more um, uh, relevant. I think um, we need to uh, 
you know, update our method statements and our risk assessments. It's the same with any sort of new technology being brought onto a construction site. Uh, for the first two or three years, everybody mistrusts it. They say it's a safety error or safety uh, um, issue. And then three or four or five years later, it becomes the normal practice and people just get on with it and find uh, ways of mitigating those risks. So I think there's, um, you know, there's good, good ways of resolving um, those issues. So we've mentioned a, a few of the, the issues there, you know, kind of like uh, things like connectivity um, and the, the safety side. What about the, um, the data sizes that we have um, and also the accuracy of the augmented reality uh, that we're coming down? What's your uh, experiences of those data sizes down onto your devices? I'm sorry, Ian, I didn't catch that, that last sentence there. Oh, okay, sorry, I, I think the, the internet connection to me is not the greatest in the world. Uh, <laughs> technology, eh? Um, yes. So uh, I was just, just thinking on the, the two other things that needed to be uh, mentioned. One was the data sizes. Uh, and the other was accuracy. Um, so on the data size, how much information um, can you actually store on your devices and are they man enough for the job? Um, and secondly, the accuracy of the device itself, giving you XYZ coordinate for the focal point of the camera of that device, um, are the standard um, uh, you know, inertial, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, GPS, whatever built into your device actually accurate enough to give you the results that you need or do you have to go out and buy a specific accurized device to carry out that job? So, uh, Colin? Yeah, so, so I don't think we've, I mean certainly accuracy is a concern. And that's something that uh, you know that we've looked at and and are still struggling with to, to some extent. We have not gone down the route of, of buying a specific device to you know increase accuracy yet uh, on any of our pilots that I'm aware of. Um, but that's that's definitely been something that's been a problem. I have not heard anything about uh, uh, volume of data being an issue at this point. But uh, I mean, we we have not tried to to load. You know, large, you know, plant size models or anything down uh, in anything that we've done at this point. So, um, back perhaps to uh, to Stephen on that one. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, I think you know the challenge of of accuracy, I think, is is definitely you know, as, as Colin mentioned, is a real challenge to consider. Um, but I think it's also it's it's a broad question, and I I think I'm I sounding like a broken record here, but I I. I I do think some of it matters on what the use case is. I think different use cases will have very different tolerances of what is good enough, for lack of a better term. Um, so I think you know, as the technology advances, um, we'll get better with with having the augmented content link up exactly with the virtual. Um, but you know, for some uses, and at least some of my own personal experience of the the devices that uh, or the um, applications I've I've worked to develop, we kind of took a what's good enough approach. So um, an augmented content might be off by six inches, but when you're you know 50 feet away from a wall, six inches is um, in some cases is kind of close enough to get a, a sense of. Uh, in, in my case, it was a design application. And as far as the other other half of the question related to kind of uh, data size, uh, we kind of I, what I had done was more of kind of what Colin was alluding to of kind of stripped down the model, used a portion of it, um, and and I think back to the point that Monty made earlier that did limit uh, you know the ability of flexibility we had with uh, with the tool we were working with. It was very uh, targeted, um, and so as of now, you know, on a mobile device or smartphone. Um, for me, for my experience, at least, that has been a real challenge of loading um, heavy models, and it does slow the device down a lot if you if you need all of that content. Yeah, I certainly agree with you know what what is good enough for that particular device. There was at the at the weekend one of my um, guys I was down the uh, out on the town with, and he brought up a uh, an application on his iPhone 
that overlaid information on what shops were down a particularly uh, specific street and how far away they might be. So, I mean, it didn't have to be uh, accurate at all. It just, you know, it just knew you were in that street and you were roughly this far along that street. Uh, and when you turn one way, it said that these shops were this way in this order and those shops were that way in that order. And that is accurate enough to find rough areas and, and things that you want to find. But then when you're trying to imagine that a, a, a beam that you put in your, um, your BIM model lines up with the pads that you've actually constructed now um, with tolerances of, of potentially millimeters, you've got to have something pretty, uh, pretty smart in there or not actually use augmented reality for that particular task at all because it's the wrong tool for the wrong task. Um, before we move on, I just wanted to introduce uh, Vaz uh, Venikos from CH2M Hill who's uh, joined us as one of the panelists. Um, Vaz, can you just give us a, a quick introduction to yourself? I, I think Ian, he's, he's, mute. Oh, he's unmuted now, he's fine. Carry, carry on Vaz. No. Can you, can you hear us? No, he's, he's muted himself again. Um, yeah. Okay. I don't have any no control over that at all. Um, the only other way you can do it is to dial in. Um, give, give him another sure we, Give him another few. You know, while. Um, so, carrying on with those themes of, of location um, and uh, data size, um, we heard from um, Stephen and also from Manny, I think. Um, how about um, uh, um, Colin? Well, have we all, sorry, I've, I've uh, lost writing down everybody who was <laughs> spoken so far on that particular Yeah, no thing. problem. I, I think I, I spoke to that already. Yeah, I, I also wanted to add something to it. I, you know, I think the discussion on the accuracy is very relevant, and I'm really glad that Stephen brought the uh, importance of the use case. I think there's a number of uh, things uh, when it comes to accuracy. One is how accurately we have, um, we can track the location of the user in 3D space. Then the second question is how accurately we can overlay uh, 3D CAD slash BIM information on, on, on the uh, uh, field of view of the user. And the third one is whether we would like to use this sort of uh, augmented image for any sort of uh, performance monitoring purpose, whether that happens to be quality monitoring, whether that happens to be progress monitoring, and obviously based on the use case, the, uh, uh, the level of accuracy that will be needed is different. I guess uh, in the context of what we've been discussing, uh, mainly so far, it's been access to information. So the accuracy will be more on the uh, tracking the location of the user and being able to accurately overlay uh, beam information on the image. Uh, so I guess uh, obviously this could be uh, uh, defined in different uh, use cases. Um, now, on the size of uh, data, I also want to go back to the discussion that we had early on, on the fact that this information needs to be used for collaboration among multiple parties that are on and off-site. So I think um, capability of storing information on the device is important, given the uh, discussion that we had early on on uh, connectivity issue. But the other issue that I wanted to br uh, bring up is the capability of rendering information into the view um, of the user. I think obscuring the view of the user is obviously one issue. But the second issue is we currently don't have enough sophisticated rendering capabilities that will be able to bring all kinds of uh, project information um, at the desired level of abstraction to um, the location and viewpoint of the user. Um, so we need to figure out how we will be able to manage information so enough information will be presented to the user um, and be able to uh, handle that rendering capabilities. I think one solution that can potentially address this issue in a short period of time is to think about some form of a near real-time uh, mobile augmented reality in a sense that the user will be able to uh, take a picture, um, uh, record a video for a short uh, period of time, and then be able to augment the information on that so the system has uh, you know, um, a little bit of uh, computation time to essentially uh, uh, figure out what amount of information will be um, um, essentially beneficial to the user. Um, so I guess uh, the size of the data could be managed perhaps by some form of uh, uh, smarter strategy of uh, uh, leveraging um, um, location tracking information plus uh, a cloud-based solution for uh, storing information. Yeah. Um, 
Interesting. Uh, I don't. Has anybody else got any, any thoughts in one way uh, along those lines? Okay. Um, I think um, on the uh, one of the uh, the other things I wanted to, to raise up on the augmented reality side is. Um, what kind of reality are you actually augmenting? Most of us look and, and as you were saying, they're kind of the near real time and the real time augmentation. Um, but what about um, augmentation of uh, things like panoramas, uh, photographs, videos, uh, and the like that we know we can get great accuracy on? Um, but aren't real time because they've been post, uh, processed um, in the past, uh, but are very useful tools nonetheless to um, help people do whatever they need to be able to do on that uh, on that site. Um, so, any thoughts on those? I mean, one one comment on those that I think they may uh, bring some value is, you know, to the point of collaboration and maybe even remote collaboration where um, you are using AR as an interface, but you're using AR with someone who's, you know, two time zones over. Uh, something like the panorama may be a good approach um, of kind of communicating either construction progress or whatever, whatever the, the use case is for it, but communicating that to someone else who wouldn't have had the freedom to say uh, change their field of view with the Google Glass or move their iPad around or whatever it was. And I think for some of those instances there there could be some real value to, to that kind of panorama approach because the person's not going to have the real-time control anyway, um, so that may be handy. Um, I, the panorama approach, I think you, you, you highlighted one of the challenges there, is because it's not real-time, some of the um, uh, benefits that we've seen some people at least striving for in the, in the mobile tools of having someone physically walk around a space and get that sort of tactile sense of uh, what a space looks like or feels like um, may, may be lost with that use case. So. It may have some limitations in in that particular regard. Yeah, I think, and and it's it's that um, I suppose cheapness yeah, uh, and the accessibility of things like that. The first step into um, being able to deliver an augmented reality type um, application or um, solution to your um, uh, problems. Um, I'm told here on the on the chat that uh, Vaz has uh, hopefully joined us now. Uh, so yes, I have my hand. Can you give us a quick introduction, please? Um, sure. Apologies for the um, for the delay, but uh, I logged on through the phone and I couldn't speak, so I logged on through the internet and I couldn't speak. So I logged on both and I can now. Um, so I'm um, I'm the head of um, BIM development for a European operations for CHM Hill with um, heavy bias on, on transportation and uh, amongst the technologies we are developing is the immersive visualizations which we use for several, several in several ways and in, in several projects. Um, one is for uh, stakeholder engagement so it's very much the making it as real as possible and the other one is uh, for design reviews uh, predominantly for uh, rail projects. Um, with uh, with uh, Bond Street Station, which is one of the crossroad stations, and and Tottenham Court Road stations, were the two stations that we tested the technology. And now uh, uh, London Underground, which is very keen, one of our most um, uh, sort of innovative clients, um, we have Bromley by Bow, which is just started, and uh, these technologies are, are following this project uh, and see how and we're measuring. Uh, add value to the project. So, um, Baz, we've been talking a little bit about um, the uh, issues surrounding augmented reality, um, those specifically uh, around accuracy, um, uh, the uh, connectivity of the device for, for real-time uh, data input and extraction, uh, and also some of the um, the data sizes issues. Have you got any experience around those, or do you have an additional um, 
issue that is impacting on your usage of uh, AR? Um, a AR was one of the options with regards to engaging with the supply chain and, and making our model more vivid. Um, and we found that augmented reality is a very uh, individual focused uh, technology. I think that you're not as such able able to have a meeting within the environment um, and, and we found that it, it is not always easy to uh, identify the value, the business value and therefore to the business case to move that forward when it comes to infrastructure. So um, we are very keen on, on, on massive visualizations, we're very keen on, on um, augmented reality with regards to personal use of, 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 of different specific elements but not as a as a, as a, as yet uh, as a full package. That's a very that's a very uh, honest and direct answer. <laughs> oh, spot on. Thanks, Faz. Um, so one of the things that um, I'll, I'll throw out as a as a thought here for the for the panel. Um, one of the things that we've stumbled across within virtual reality is the ability for multiple people, wherever they may be, to be um, donning a headset, looking at the same thing, discussing the same problems, and highlighting those, extracting information, uh, and making um, decisions based on what they can see. Now, taking that leap into the augmented reality side, if somebody is standing on site, looking at something, looking at a view, looking at um, uh, a reality which has been augmented with potentially a, a new object or a new design or a new bit of steel work, um, but that view is being shared with other people around the world um, to be able to either add live information to, to update, to remove from, to provoke a discussion on perhaps uh, things like class resolution or um, uh, design reviews or for um, introducing uh, you know either a client or an operations and maintenance staff to that particular site whilst you're, um, you know only one person needs to walk around it looking at that view with the um, uh, the view augmented um, yeah it's a thought I don't know anybody's got any any ideas on that or perhaps they've already done it So I'll, I'll throw that one uh, out, out and, and just start at the top of the list. So I'm afraid I'm going to pick on you uh, first, Colin. Yep. No, no problem. That's that's what I get for being on the top of the list, right? Um, yeah. So from our side, I mean, I, I think it gets back to kind of what Vass says as well as really, you know, identifying the value in it and you know and, and help that drive the, the technology and, and I think we've struggled with that a bit as well and, and I mentioned it before around you know what what are the use cases that drive us to augmented reality and I think that's something that you know we haven't really found one that uh, around that kind of shared augmented experience yet that, uh, that has really pushed us to that functionality at this point. Yeah, if I can just make a quick comment on that. I mean, I think the the point that Baz brought up is is, a, is an interesting point and a good point um, in that a lot of the augmented reality interfaces are tailored to that one person. So you you could set up an interface where, for instance, one camera, uh, that one viewpoint is shared among, you know, projected or viewed by a bunch of, of different folks and they see that same experience. You know, I think the other way you can look at this, though, especially in um, AR from a collaborative standpoint, is as the mobile computing, as the smartphones, the tablets get more powerful and cheaper, I think the other option is you can use AR as a way of giving everyone a personal experience of viewing content to their own own viewpoint with their own device but have multiple people in a room so that you still get that collaborative nature of uh, doing let's say a constructability review or something where um, you might have a room um, framed 
but maybe you don't have all of the duct work in or the conduits uh, placed or whatever the, the use case may be. Um, so I think you know in the future we, we may be able to use some of these kind of good enough approaches um, and some of the mobile tools as a way of facilitating an individualized AR experience but in a collaborative environment where you can still get some of those benefits of co-locating people. So um, just wandering back down through the uh, the list here, um, any additional um, points on that one from the panel? Okay, um, so I there's there's lots of issues potentially around um, AR, not only looking at what processes we need to tackle and what is good enough for those processes in technology front on accuracy, on data, or collaboration, etc. And setting those expectations, because I think a lot of the time when we deploy uh, a new bit of technology, um, the expectation sometimes can be set too high, and when that technology lands on the people who have actually got to do um, uh, the work on, on site, um, it's a disappointment to them and so therefore can hamper a rollout of a new um, innovation. So I think there's, there's lots of things we need to take away from that on, um, on the AR and, and some of the visualization stuff. Um, one of the things I wanted to uh, ask not only the, the panel but also all those attendees on here is something we've been running that commits days for the last um, oh, six months or so, and I've been trying to get more people involved in this, is to do uh, uh, call them 10 minute tech reviews. So if you found a new mobile um, uh, application or a new device or a new anything, and you're really interested in it, it's not specifically yours, much, if it's a quality vendor, but something you've been using and you think you've got some value out of it. It would be really nice to hear just whether it's four minutes, whether it's five minutes, or whether it's just a 30 second, I downloaded this app and used it, and it's been pretty useful to me out on site. Um, so if you've got any thoughts on those, if you could feed that back to um, Fernando, um, just to say well, what I'd like to, uh, to show uh, and why I think it's a good idea. Um, that would be really cool. It would be really good to hear from you all because the more we collaborate, the more we share these ideas, um, the better. So um, just to, to give you a bit of an idea of one of the things that uh, you, know, you do come across from day to day, um, I downloaded an app a few uh, weeks ago called CAMFIND, C-A-M-F-I-N-D. Um, it's really cool. It's a free app um, and what it does is it, I suppose in a way, does reverse of augmented reality in the fact that you take a photograph of whatever you're looking at and it goes off onto the internet, identifies what that object is and then tells you where you can buy a lot of beer take a photograph of that pint of beer and it goes off and finds, it, it identifies that it is uh, a pint of beer and the nearest place to buy a pint of beer from is um, a bar around the corner. Or when we took a photograph of Neil um, Pawsey uh, on the last community day, it identified that he was wearing a cardigan and a white t-shirt and these are the things that you could buy at this shop just down around the corner. So, I find it a really interesting application and almost reversing augmenting reality. It's taking reality and adding more uh, or, or extracting information from reality rather than adding information to that reality. See what I mean? Um, so if, if so team, Ian, what was the name of the app again that you were mentioning? So C A N F I N D. Ian, yeah, I wanted to add a comment on this. Um, this um, CAM Find app um, is an app that is actually developed by two of our graduates from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, so I know pretty much about the uh, the system. Um, 
Uh, so it's a, it's a pretty appealing tool. Um, these guys have been working on a fundamental problem that we call it object detection, uh, meaning that you know, given any picture that you'd be provided, the question is can you automatically and almost in near real time identify the object at the right level of abstraction. Um, this is a truly fundamental computer vision problem and as of now, the state of the art uh, performance in automated object detection is somewhere around 50%. So it's not better than uh, just taking a chance of whether you'd be able to say this object is whatever category or not. Uh, so what these guys have done is a slightly different strategy where they call it um, crowdsourcing, whereby people uh, around the world are actually essentially helping out with annotating these uh, photos with the right object categories. Uh, so their solution is not entirely automated, rather there are people who are assisting with the task of labeling uh, the objects you see in the scene. Um, the information that they provide is definitely very interesting, but I just want to emphasize on the fact that this is not um, yet an automated solution. There's uh, lots of uh, research uh, that needs to be done um, so we can get to uh, automated object detection. Fantastic. But, but the thought is there that perhaps if you're walking around your construction site, instead of having to um, you know, uh, know where you are, your camera actually recognizes the objects around you and just is able to overlay things based on what it's seeing rather than on where it thinks it is. Um, just another, um, I don't know, another angle on that accuracy uh, point. Uh, but uh, I thought it was an interesting um, app to play with. And certainly there will be lots of other applications that all of you on here, not only the panelists, but also the attendees, will have um, you know, viewed its watch. But I, I would really like uh, one of the next um, mobile community of interests to throw it open to the floor and allow people to have a, uh, a two minutes, five minute soapbox to say, I found this app, I think it's pretty cool, I think it's going to be rather useful in construction or in uh, engineering or wherever it might be. Um, and share a little bit of that knowledge with the, uh, the rest of the community. Well, I don't know whether any of the panelists in the last few minutes have, have downloaded a, a good app or, or found a bit of technology of late that they'd like to share with us. So Ian, actually, to, to real quick, conscious that we've only got a couple of minutes left, but I, I want to hop back to the augmented reality challenges mm -hmm. for a second. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't talked any about uh, kind of change management and and how do we how do we get this technology incorporated into uh, the folks that are going to actually use it because I think that's something that we've seen is you know is is you know some of the construction teams see this as you know another another gimmicky technology that's going to be difficult to use and you know and so there's some resistance to that a bit and I, and I wanted to hear if there's anyone else on the panel that uh, has some you know similar kind of thoughts or, or how they you guys have handled that in your organizations. Yes, I think from a system heal perspective, we I think we found that at times some of the uh, the gadgets or the technical technology advancement in the visualization arena were seen by many project managers on the sharp end, end of the uh, project delivery where the pressure is to um, deliver something on budget and in time um, quite gimmicky. But I think you go th through the low hanging fruit, the, the, the route of um, the, the least resistance and, and I think this is, this is the easiest way to implement such technologies. If the technology works and you can prove a case study, then I think they they understand the value. But you always have people that are the early adopters and the people that would follow when they are convinced that this is something that would work. So, so really, kind of a proof of concept, to prove value, prove functionality is is the approach that you've taken there. Yes, very much so. Yes. I think we've, okay. uh, we've hit the, uh, the top of the hour here. Um, so what I just wanted to do was thank you very much to the panelists for um, coming along today to talk a little bit about augmented reality and some of the challenges that uh, they they see 
uh, in front of us and also some of the applications. Um, uh, and thank Fernando and, and Stuart for organising this. And um, what I'd like to do is to um, potentially list some of these challenges and get those out in a in a document. I presume Fernando, you will uh, you'll put some notes out from the discussion over the next couple of weeks. Um, and I'm also ask people in the future to uh, to think about those alternative technologies. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Ian. Um, we will certainly do that over the next week or so. Um, we'll pick up on what, what has been said here today, um, and we will follow up with everybody. If there's anybody in the meanwhile got any questions they'd like to ask, then please go ahead and, and send those through to me. Um, I'm, I'm quite happy to, to take those questions on and um, respond and respond to everybody. Um, before we finish off, what I would like to do is just remind everybody that the, the subgroup is um, is part of the Mobile IT Community of Interest, which which meets the third Wednesday of each month at 9 a.m. US Central, uh, minus 6 GMT. Our next meeting is next week on the uh, 17th. Um, please do save the date and join us for that. Um, and please do join in the community on LinkedIn for all announcements and follow-ups. Uh, you can upload the recordings from the previous mobile IT uh, community, mobile IT community of interest on YouTube. I've had several requests for those this week. It seems that that's gathering a pace. Um, and please follow up with Peer Tech and Comet on Twitter and Facebook for more news about the work in our organizations and the industry at large. Um, thank you very much for spending time with us today. Thanks very much for the panelists um, for their time. And uh, thanks everybody else coming in as attendees. I hope you've enjoyed it. And we really hope to see you next time. Thank you very much. Bye for now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye.